This is Mr. Tegmeyer, and this presentation is about gears, pulley drives, and sprockets. And we're going to go over some examples. We're going to define what gears, pulleys, drive, pulley drives, and sprockets are, and uh, we'll go over some equations. So let's get started. So gears, pulleys, and sprockets, uh, you're familiar with all these things, whether you, you think you are or not. Uh, but they all do basically the same thing. They have some advantages and disadvantages, which we will go over. But really, they do three things. One of three things. Uh, they change the speed of rotation. And by the way, they all change, uh, change the motion or change energy or transfer energy through rotation, unlike a, a lot of a, the simple machines that we looked at. They also will change the direction of rotation and they can change the amount of torque available to do work. Uh, it could be an increase or a decrease in torque. So let's start taking a look at gears first. So gears you're familiar with. Gears basically are the things that have interlocking teeth. Those are, that's the distinguishing feature for gears, uh, which differ from sprockets, which we'll get to in a little bit as well. But a gear train is when two or more gears are meshed together. And mesh is the word that we use when they kind of come together. And when we have a gear train, we, ha we always have one gear that is the input. We call that gear the driver gear. And one gear that is the output, or we call that the driven gear. So a couple of key points uh, on this slide that uh, we'll, we'll talk about. So here you see two gears on top and three gears on the bottom, blue and red. And when mating gears turn, um, I don't know if you've ever really thought about it, but when they turn, they always turn in opposite directions when you're talking about specific pairs. When you have three gears, which you see on the bottom, the two blue and the red, the middle gear is called an idler gear. And really, its only function is to change the direction of the output gear so that it's turning the exact same direction as the input or the driver gear. On this slide, we'll talk a little bit about um, how they lock together and, and how they move. So it says here the RPM of the larger gear. RPM stands for revolutions per minute. And that's how fast it rotates. So when we think of a car which travels in a straight line, we talk about speed and miles per hour. And when we talk about anything that rotates, we talk about revolutions per minute. So if you look at the green gear and the blue gear, those are on the same shaft, and those are always going to turn in the same direction, and they're always going to turn at the same speed. So another characteristic of gear motion is that the larger gear is always going to rotate, is always going to have a smaller number of revolutions per minute than a smaller gear. Key points to remember. So let's take a look at gear ratios. Um, a gear ratio is analogous uh, in rotating things like gears and sprockets and pulleys. It's analogous to mechanical advantage. And we need to know and define some variables, first of all. Uh, and here you see them. N is the number of teeth. D is the diameter. So that's going to have a length. That's not a W there. That's actually the Greek letter omega. And that is the angular velocity or speed. Or, uh, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the revolutions per minute. T, in this case, is called torque. And you're familiar with torque from simple machines, it's a force times a distance, or you can kind of think of it as a rotating force. So if we take a look at the gears in the, in the upper right, the blue and the red, um, it's defined some things for us. The red is our input gear, and the blue is our output gear. Uh, it has the, let's talk about the red gear. The red gear has uh, six teeth, so you see down below N sub N is six. So if you count the teeth that it has, it has six teeth, or cogs. It has a two-inch diameter, 
And it's important to know that that diameter is measured from the very outside of the teeth, not the inside. It has an angular speed of 40 revolutions per minute, and it's not stated on the diagram, but we're going to assume it has a torque of 40 foot-pounds. And again, the units on torque or our force times distance. And then for blue, you can see what, uh, what we have defined there. 12 teeth, a 4-inch diameter, 20 revolutions per minute, and 80 foot-pounds of torque. So let's look at some equations next and figure out what the gear ratio is for this specific case. Well, I'm not going to derive anything uh, for this case, but here are some things that you need to know. And all of these are interchangeable, by the way. So GR is the gear ratio. And the gear ratio is simply uh, the output over the input for everything except the angular velocity. So we can look at the ratio of the number of teeth, output over input, the ratio of the diameters, output over input, the ratio of the torques, output over input. Um, and it's important to note here that uh, the torque is denoted by the Greek letter tau. <clears throat> we can use tau or t. Uh, t. You should use tau to be technically accurate. And then finally, the uh, ratio for angular speed is not output over input. It's the other way around. It's actually the input angular speed divided by the output angular speed. <clears throat> so a good way to remember that is out over in except for when. That's how I remember it. So if we plug in the numbers, our gear ratio, which is denoted there by the question mark, and we always want to put our units, is 2 to 1, no matter how we look at that, whether it's the number of teeth, whether it's the torque, whatever numbers we put in there, it's always going to be 2 to 1. So let's look at a, a different gear train, and let's take a look at what we want to find out is what is the, the gear ratio for this total gear train from A to D. And the way we do that is we take a look at the gear ratio from A to B first, so we see that from A to B, the number of teeth and the output gear, in this case B, that's 12, and the input gear is, uh, has 20 teeth, so it's a 6 to 1 ratio. And we do the same thing for B to C, and we get 5 to 12, and then we have to do the same thing for C to D, and we get 4 to 1. Well, what is the total gear ratio then, because I'm interested in what my output is at D, not necessarily at B or C. So here's how we do that. We simply multiply all those gear ratios and we come up with something kind of interesting. Well, in this case, it just happens to be 1 over 1. So what we did is we multiplied the gear ratio from A to B, which is 0.6, from B to C, which is 0.42, and then from C to D, which is 4 to 1. We multiply all those together to get a one-to-one -one ratio. But here's where what makes it interesting. Those idler gears, we can really ignore. So if we took the gear ratio uh, from A to D, they have the same number of teeth, 20 and 20. So essentially, we can ignore all those idler gears. That comes in handy, but we can only do that for simple gear trains like we see here. And um, just a real quick note on how gear ratios compare with compound machines. They're very similar, uh, which I had already mentioned. The gear ratio is essentially analogous to uh, mechanical advantage, uh, except where uh, torque and force are fairly synonymous. So when you have a compound machine, <clears throat> remember when you put machines together, simple machines together, you multiply the mechanical advantage. And we're going to do the same thing for uh, gear ratios. But that's we'll take a look at that on the next slide.
So here let's take a look at this uh, example compound machine. Here we have uh, a wheel and axle, a gear train, and another wheel and axle. And the wheel and axle is simulated by uh, the bar with the effort force that uses the, uh, the gear. It drives that pink gear and then our output or our resistance is the bar that uh, is driven by the blue gear. So how do we calculate these things? First let's take a look at the wheel and axle. Uh, so it's important to note here that it's pretty obvious that our effort distance is four inches. What we want to do to calculate our resistance distance, it is actually just the radius of that gear because that's where we're going to get our resistance. It's going to be at 1.5 inches. So when we do that math, we come up with a mechanical advantage of 2.67. And let's take a look at the gear train then. So here we want to take a look not at mechanical advantage, but we want to take a look at the gear ratio. And we want to take a look at what we know. We're given the number of teeth. So the pink gear is driving the blue gear. So our output number of teeth is 24. The pink gear has 60 teeth. Then we come up with a gear ratio of 0.4. Finally, when we look at the last wheel and axle, we come up with a mechanical advantage when we do that math of 0.15. Again, it's important to note that the effort distance is 0.6. And the, uh, I'm sorry, the resistance is 4 inches. Kind of have to think about that a little bit. So when we put together our mechanical advantage, we have 2.67 times 0.15, and we get 0.4. And then our gear ratio total is just the gear ratio of, the, uh, of what we calculated. That's also 0.4. Well, next let's take a look at a compound gear train. We looked at a simple gear train where we had four gears that uh, we're touching in a row and here we're going to take a look at an example where two gears actually share an axle. And here you can see that the blue and the yellow gears share an axle. And it's important to note, uh, I stated this before, that they're both rotating at the same speed. So we've put our four gears together in our gear train. And uh, I had mentioned in but it says here on the slide that the two middle gears operate at the same speed or the same rotation. And so what does this do for us? It basically allows that uh, red gear to produce a lot more torque than if we were to put this in a simple gear train. So let's take a look at our uh, compound gear ratios here because it's going to be a different calculation. Here we're going to have to multiply. So first, let's take a look at the gear ratio between A and B. We're given the number of teeth. So A is 10. It has 10 teeth. That's what 10T stands for there. And B has 40 teeth. So we come up with a gear ratio between A and B of 4. Then we have to look at C and D. And that is, we've got 50 teeth and 20 teeth. We don't do anything. Uh, there's no gear ratio between B and C because they're not meshed. So for the entire gear train, we multiply the two together. So we get uh, 4 times 2.5, and we get a gear ratio of 10. Let's now take a look at uh, some belts and pulleys. The exact same equations apply. Uh, we don't have a gear ratio per se, but we have a lot of the same relationships. So we have diameters, we have angular speeds, and we have torques. And we're given some things here. Uh, we're given in the uh, red pulley, it's rotating at 30 RPMs and has a diameter of two inches. And you can see the corresponding numbers for the blue pulley. And we also are given some torques as well. So if we plug in those numbers and take a look at them, they're the same. And we can also use those same equations for our sprocket and chain system. You, you can think of a bike. You know this from a bicycle 
Uh, and there are lots of other things. You can look inside some engines and see some chains. Your garage door opener is either going to use uh, a chain or it might use a belt and pulley. Whatever it uses, we can use these equations. And when you plug in the given numbers here, you can see that they are all equal. Big difference between a sprocket and chain system and gears is that uh, sprockets, while they have teeth, they don't mesh. They're apart and they engage the, uh, the links of the chain and that's how they transfer their torque and rotation. So let's take a look real quick and, and compare when you might want to use uh, a pulley uh, or sprocket. Uh, and I think this is a really good slide to, uh, uh, you don't have to necessarily memorize it, you can kind of think through it. Um, so it, a pulley transports its force with a belt. And the way to think about this slide is if you have an automatic garage door opener, it's going to use either a pulley and a belt or a chain and sprocket. So I have a quiet uh, garage door opener. Mine uses a pulley. I don't have to lubricate it. It's pretty cheap. The disadvantage is that it can slip. And you probably all have heard um, cars that would start up in the winter and they squeak really. That's belt slipping. And that's one disadvantage of having a pulley. So a sprocket though is going to have uh, um, it's going to have lubrication and it's going to be noisy and uh, you can have some slip there as well. Or I'm sorry, no slip. But it's going to have a lot greater strength. And that concludes our presentation on chains and sprockets, belts and pulleys, and gears.